thinks they're not in tension. So I'm productive, but I have a lot of personal freedom. And so about a decade ago, David Brooks, the, the New York Times guy now, gave the name bourgeois bohemian to the person who reconciles successfully in his personal life, autonomy and productivity. So I'm productive, I work hard, I never miss work, but I'm also bohemian. That is, I'm tasteful, I'm open to new experiences and all that. But bourgeois bohemian really is an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp, military kind of you know, intelligence, yada, yada, yada. So the truth of the matter is, in the life of the bourgeois bohemian, bourgeois trumps bohemian at every turn. And my next few uh, minutes are going to be about that. So these autonomy, these imperatives of productivity and autonomy suggest, for example, that there's dignity in separating sex from birth and death. And so making it an absolutely free expression of who I am. So when we separate sex from birth and death, number one is productive in the sense that it's safe. Because productivity is all about not getting killed, sustaining a, uh, a being. So what makes sex dangerous is birth and death. If you attack you from that, you're OK. And then what makes sex slavish from an autonomy point of view is somehow connected with birth and death. So productivity and autonomy uh, points to this free expression of yourself. So this view, uh, the view put forth by our college administrators, this is true even at my southern small college, is that the only limitations to sexual behavior should be safety and consent. You can do whatever you want as long as it's safe and as long as it's consensual. A free being does what he or she pleases so long as he or she does not bring another free being into existence cause a free beings to demise, or tyrannizes over another free being. And of course, it goes without saying, a productive being also doesn't allow love to get in the way of work. An autonomous being refuses to allow love, the result of mere biological instinct, run amok, uh, to produce unfree or undignified behavior. So it's no wonder that we live in a particularly unerotic time. And this is why bourgeois bohemia is not really bohemian, because bohemians are the, the maybe do bad things, but at least they're erotic. Or at least they enjoy life. So here's a sign of this. Maybe that's why today food has become more exciting than sex. Food has become more of a dangerous liaison and risky business. I don't know if you all notice this. I realize because of your religious discipline, you've been this way for a long time, nonetheless. <laughs> everyone else, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you be like, you know, Seinfeld. Not that there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> uh, but Americans in general, sophisticated Americans in general, have become increasingly paranoid, puritanical, and prohibitionist when it comes to food from a health and safety perspective. And why not? Gluttony is, a, gluttony is a vice that can kill you, or at least make you fat, and so less pretty, pleasing, and productive. Sex can only kill you if it gets mixed up with too much love, such as the case of Romeo and Juliet, or if it's unprotected. So the bourgeois bohemian says that the truth is you can't have too much recreational sex, and it's puritanical and prohibitionist to uh, think otherwise, but uh, you can only have one dessert at most. So how bohemian could it be to make sex that neurotic and food that scary? Uh, safe sex is the bourgeois view of sex, and obsessive calorie and carb counting is the bourgeois view of food. And I have, to have an example of this, which I'm already running behind. Uh, I don't know if you all watch the show Mad Men. And it's a very ambiguous show in many respects. But the title Mad Men refers literally to advertising executives in New York. That's what they call each other. But Mad Men, the title really means, the not so concealed subtext is, back in those days, people were crazy because they lived lives that were so unsafe. They smoked, they drank, they only had exercise when it was fun, and they just were so unguarded. Now, the show is really politically correct because it shows us that all the vices of the past were the cause of the madness. But it's very selective because it's really true that people in the past had more fun because they were more courageous. They took their families more seriously and all that and all that. 
And so the 50s and 60s in general were probably better than now because men weren't hostile to military service. Men had children uh, and all that. So in the past, when people weren't obsessed with productivity and autonomy, people were mad. So we have liberated women and safe everything else. So now finally people are sane. All right, I gotta be real fast. So the, the, the conflict uh, between being bourgeois and being bohemian was, it used to be the American conflict. So you, you all see the whiny movie, it's a good book actually, the whiny movie, Revolutionary Road, that it used to be bohemians thought people in the suburbs were uninteresting. And so the bohemian rebelled against people in the suburbs. And bohemians weren't careerists. They dropped out of college, and as a result became famous writers, you know, going way beyond the professors. And so in the 50s, there were left-wing bohemians, like you know, crazy people like Allen Ginsberg, not a role model, uh, but there are also right-wing bohemians, people like Russell Kirk, who just couldn't make it in our career as a professorial system. So these people had this objection to bourgeois life. You can't really enjoy yourself. You can't be a whole human being. There's no development. The soul. It was actually a good objection. Then the 1960s come along, you have this tremendous illusion. We can be bohemian without being bourgeois. We've conquered scarcity. We don't have to be productive anymore. People can do their own thing. But there are 86 things wrong with the 60s, and here's the top two. Number one, do your own thing became utterly empty. I'm going, to do, I'm going to get up in the morning and do my own thing, but I can't get any guidance from the past because that would get in the way of autonomy, so I can't really figure out what my thing is. So the 60s become more wacky and more empty, and towards the end of the 60s, a lot of majors and even studies start to break out. All right, and, but, the, but, the other thing, <laughs> but the other thing wrong with the 60s was, it turns out you don't conquer scarcity forever. you got to keep being productive. You can't say, we've defeated nature, we have an economy of plenty, let's take the rest of our lives off. It doesn't work that way. you got to keep going to work, and so you got to be productive. So we learned from the 60s that we still need the bourgeois virtues. But it seems to me, here's what really happened in American education. We decided that anything that uh, got in the way of people being productive, we would call repressive. So here's what the... Uh, See, our professors today, although they're for productivity, find a lot good about the 60s transformation. The moral, uh, the freedom of individuals from the arbitrary categories of race, class, and gender, and even sexual orientation uh, was achieved. So was the liberation of sexual appetite from pointless guilt. Uh, so was the luring of women out of the home and into the workplace in the name of both autonomy and productivity. And so was heightened skepticism about traditional religious uh, openness. So what the 60s did is reconfigure autonomous self-fulfillment to make it perfectly compatible with health, safety, and productivity. So you all know this libertarian writer, Tyler Cowan, kind of the smartest, the most tasteful of the libertarian writers. He has a tremendous uh, website on, on restaurants, uh, on ethnic restaurants and how to enjoy them. And there's so much to learn from that website.